So, for this evening's talk, I'm going to talk about happiness. Is that a good title for the talk? Yeah. <laughs> and the reason is because the last week I've been got so many letters, emails, all sorts of stuff because finally they proved the Buddhist monks are actually more happy than others. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm enjoying this. This was from, this is many um, extracts here. This was from the Times of London. On scanning the brains of Buddhist monks and others who practice religious meditation, two groups of researchers separately confirmed that it is visibly, biologically provable that such people are happier than the norm. And my comment, see, I told you so. <laughs> All these years we've been telling you this and finally it's been proved. Those who follow the Four Noble Truths and cultivate detachment, acceptance, the control of the desires and the contemplation of the moment's beauty are not only serene but strong. The gymnasts of the mind, said one scientist admiringly. Even when not enwrapped in formal meditation, they are less likely to be shocked, flustered, angry, or even surprised. You can, experimenters found, fire a gun near them, but please don't try. <laughs> and they barely jump. Yet at the same time, they are unusually sensitive to tiny signs of emotion in other human faces. We can now hypothesis we can now hypothesize with some confidence, said Professor Flanagan of Duke University, North Carolina, that those apparently happy, calm Buddhist they say souls here. The calm Buddhist non souls <laughs> really are happy. They say here, the basic tenets of Buddhism are easier to turn towards. Live every moment and every act fully. Accept that all things pass. Control your desires without starving them. Do not kill or quarrel. Hatred cannot be ended by more hatred. Forgive others and yourself. Be kind. Contemplate the beautiful. Many of its sayings are superb. I am particularly fond of the maxim that churning water for however long a time does not produce butter. That's actually from the suttas there. I very rarely said that, but it's wonderful. Churning water for however long a time does not produce butter. So trying to make money does not produce happiness. <laughs> There are government ministries that would do well to put that up on the wall. What is it here I've got here? Uh, okay, they're doing about the investigation here of um, uh, Prozac and other things to make you happy. There are safer routes to calm. The conduct... We should not need so many of these happiness pills. That's Prozac and that stuff. The conduct of consciousness is private to each one of us. And you can't pass laws compelling meditation. Why not? <laughs> but there are aspects of public policy that help or hinder these intimate private roots of happiness. Local authorities who tend green quiet spaces in the midst of noisy cities and spend effort on holding back noise and vandalism may find it hard to justify the cost financially, but they are probably helping as much as if they built another hospital. That's really, I want to say that, I think I really agree with that. Primary schools which hold a meditation period, or instead a chill-out room with soft music and colours, report extraordinary improvements in the behaviour and learning of stressed, hyperactive children. You see, so all these years I've been saying this works. Finally, <laughs> the scientists, they did brain scans, and they actually show that the Buddhist monks, meditators, are happier so, this is what we are coming here for the sake of happiness. And that is, why is that so? It's because this is basic Buddhism. We all know if anyone asks you what is Buddhism teach, you can say the Four Noble Truths. We just mentioned it in there a few moments ago. The Four Noble Truths, and you know the way the Four Noble Truths are taught here. The Four Noble Truths are happiness. 
the cause of happiness, that sometimes there isn't happiness and why there isn't happiness. Some of you who've read the books say that's not what the Buddha said. He said suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the way to the end of suffering. But the end of suffering, as I keep on saying here, is happiness. And the way to happiness is this Eightfold Path. And sometimes there's no happiness. Why? Because of craving, desire. That's why there's no happiness sometimes. So this is actually basic Buddhist teachings. This is what the Buddha started teaching right from the very beginning, a way to happiness. If there's no happiness, why there's no happiness? If there is happiness, why there is happiness? The cause and effect of happiness. And so anyone who understands those teachings and starts to put them into practice, if it's you know, true teachings, it should make you happier. And so this is actually basic Buddhism, the path of happiness. This is what we're doing it for. Certainly why I was doing it for. The reason why I started meditating was because I was happy. It was just so much fun. A different type of happiness, a different type of fun, but I'll come across that later on in this talk. The reason why I kept precepts, well, I kept my five precepts, because it was fun to do this. Really struck people. What are you doing this for? You're trying to go to heaven or trying to be some sort of fundamentalist Buddhist by giving up alcohol in university? It's actually more fun to do that. I keep telling people that when I gave up alcohol at university, it was a courageous thing to do. All my friends were all into alcohol. Going to the pub in the evening, having a few beers, getting drunk. I gave it up. And I thought, that was it, my friends would not like to go out with a wowzer again. I thought, <coughs> I would never get invited to any more parties, but you know what happened to me. I got invited to even more parties than I did before. And the reason was because they wanted somebody sober to drive them home afterwards. <laughs> There's many advantages in giving up alcohol. And you enjoyed yourself before when you took alcohol. The first part of the party you remembered, the last part you didn't know what you were doing. It was very dangerous. <laughs> so it was marvelous to be. I was happier. I became a happier person. And so, what Buddhism was actually encouraging me to do is actually be happier and happier. And it was true. The happiest people I'd ever seen when I was a lay person were Buddhist monks. And actually, I, when I saw them, I thought this is very interesting because I'd seen the theory, and now you wanted the examples. Examples of people who have been practicing all these things for so long. Does it work or doesn't it work? And my, what I saw, my goodness, it worked. And when I decided to become a monk, I was so impressed that in this type of Buddhism that you don't have to become a monk forever. As long as you're happy, having a good time, you can stay as a monk. As a monk, you can disrobe at any moment. There's not much of a ceremony required. I can just turn to any one of you and just say, right, this is it, I'm leaving, I'm not a monk anymore. Oops. <laughs> but you have to mean it as well. And that's all it needs actually to leave. And that really impressed me with Buddhist monasticism because it meant that you weren't trying to control a person just because of some vow they made many, many years ago. And it meant because it was so easy to leave the monkhood, the only reason why people were still there was because they must be getting something out of this. There must be some enjoyment, some fulfillment, some fun. And that actually promised to me that there was something behind this, this whole path of Buddhism. And when, you went over to, when I went over to Thailand where I studied as a monk, where I became a monk, again, those people out there were just so happy. And it's crazy that they weren't having any alcohol at all. There's no sex involved. There's no, <coughs> no beer, no movies, no matrix. And they were just so happy. There's a matrix craze at the moment, stupid. And they were just so happy without all of this. And that really started to sort of show me something, that what real happiness truly was. Certainly, there's a few of the experiences which I had as a young man. I went to like a big you know, university, just scholarships. My father was very poor. I was quite bright as a kid. I went to this big college called Cambridge, you know, where your, your designation was called Young Gentleman. I had long hair, hippie bees, green velvet trousers. I was anything but a young gentleman. 
<laughs> and in this, in this particular place, you were living, because of the college system, you're actually living and associating with all these professors and lecturers. And some of them are Nobel laureates. You got to know them personally. And one thing which I found out was that just because you're brilliant in your field of science or whatever, it doesn't mean you've got any idea about life. Some of these people were going through divorces, were going through personal problems. They weren't happy. And that actually really was one of the reasons why I left academia, because with all of that intelligence, it didn't seem to be used for the right purposes of being happy. So, intelligence it wasn't seem to be the way to be happy. Now when I went to Thailand, I saw these really, really poor people. They were so poor. But my goodness, they were happier than you know, some of the rich people I knew in college. Now, some of these people were you know, almost millionaires, you know, because their parents were very, very rich and they got good educations and sent them to college. And My goodness, some of these were so rich, but they weren't happy at all. And I started looking, if I was going to sort of uh, live anywhere, I'd rather live as a poor farmer in the northeast of Thailand than as a rich person in London, basically, because they seemed happier. But what, one of the first things which I found over there was that not all of the Thai villagers were happy. Some were as miserable as the people I knew in the West. But some were really happy and, and at peace with themselves. This is 30 years ago. And I soon found out the people who were happy in the village were the people who had the, all, all, all the families always had water buffalo to plough their fields, that was almost part of the family. The people who were happy were those villagers who had one water buffalo and were content to have one water buffalo. They were as happy as anything, always ready to smile and to talk with you and, and to help out in the monastery, always ready to have a joke, always light-hearted. Just they were happy people, the sort of people you never see, or very rarely see in the Western places. But it wasn't all the people, there were some of the villagers who wanted to get on in life. Those were the villagers who had one water buffalo and wanted two water buffaloes. And they were the ones who weren't happy. And I started to realize, it was like rich wealth and poverty has nothing to do with how much you have. Nothing at all, because I see many people rich in their hearts, happy people who've got hardly anything. And I've seen poor people who've got millions and millions and millions, and live in big mansions. I remember I tell the story that <coughs> when, as a monk, sometimes one of our jobs is to go house blessing. Go to people's houses and just bless them. One family, well not family, one house I went to once in Perth, a big mansion, I think it's in Shelley or something on the riverfront, and a huge mansion. It's a by a Thai lady. I think she's, she's left there now. And during the ceremony, I asked to go to the toilet. And this is no joke, this actually happened. She had to draw me a map how to get to the toilet in her mansion. <laughs> it was that complicated. And part of the thing, we have this little holy water we sprinkle in all the rooms. I love doing that because I actually get to see, so you know, have that sticky beak around people's houses. <laughs> and she had took me so long to actually to bless this house because so many rooms. But what really struck me afterwards was there's only one person lived in it herself. She had no friends, no family, no children. She lived in this huge mansion all by herself. And that was just so sad, so lonely. She had huge wealth, but no happiness. So to me anyway, I realized that being rich doesn't mean having big houses. Being poor doesn't mean sort of living in a dirt hut. Poor or rich, I'm talking about rich in happiness or poor in happiness. It doesn't depend on how much you have, but your contentment. Which is why the Buddha kept on saying that contentment is the highest wealth. It's the richness, it's the happiness of the heart. And that's what I actually saw in these monks and these lay people in Thailand. <laughs> they had this beautiful sense of contentment and happiness. Sure, they worked hard, but they didn't want so much. 
And this is actually the core of the reason why Buddhists are more happy. Because we're encouraged not to want so much, basically. Wanting is the cause of suffering, craving, desire. Letting go, contentment, is the cause of the ending of suffering, of happiness. It's a very powerful teaching because it goes against a lot of what we do in the West. And it's part of meditation, it's part of life. We all know if you try and meditate, wanting things, you just get suffering. It's the Buddhist second noble truth, which is why I keep on saying here there's two types of meditation in the world. We talk second noble truth meditation and third noble truth meditation. Those are the two types of meditation people do. Second noble truth meditation is called craving. I want. I want to be peaceful. I want to sort of get blissed out. I want to see my past lives. I want to see the lotto numbers for this week. <laughs> I want to get rid of my pain. I want to get rid of my sickness. All wanting, wanting, wanting just leads to suffering. The Buddha said this. And it's, <coughs> it's basic Buddha's teaching. The Buddha said, letting go, giving up, craving, is the way to happiness. That's the third noble truth meditation. This is the way I've been teaching for the last few years. Just sit there and let go. The door of my heart is open to this moment, no matter what it is. It's contentment. It's putting happiness into the moment, rather than seeking happiness from somewhere outside. Instead of going searching for happiness, in somewhere in the future, in somewhere, I you know, get rich, I get win the lotto, become famous, find a beautiful partner in the world, get rid of all my problems, so sort of solve this, solve that, then I'll be happy. And of course, you know that that is never the way to happiness. You've been doing that all your life. Is your life, your work finished yet? Have you found that happiness yet, which you've been struggling for all the time? Of course not. There comes a time when you stop all that struggling to try and find happiness somewhere outside of this moment, outside of you, outside of you know, your family. That's why that happiness lies in contentment and letting go. It's a strange thing happens that what craving, what desire, what the world promises, if you work really hard then you'll be happy, try and get this and then you'll be okay. Isn't that what the adverts say? You know, if you actually go and see the matrix then you'll really be happy. You haven't lived until you've seen that. Go and sort of, you know, go overseas, go to Paris, you haven't been to Europe yet, you haven't been, you haven't lived, you haven't been happy. If you haven't sort of fallen in love, you've never been happy yet. You don't know happiness until you've had a child. All this sort of stuff, craziness. <laughs> so what is happiness? You find, sometimes I ask people, the moment in your life, when have you been most happy? Just ask yourself that question. The time so far in your life when you've really, really been happy, happiest moments of your life, what have those been? I remember just, oh, as a student, when I was working, trying to save up to go overseas. So I got my scholarship to Cambridge when I was only 17, and I had nine months off. It wasn't really a gap year, it was just, you know, just what happened. So I had nine months between finishing school before going to university. So I got a job and saved up and was going to go to North Africa and United States, Central America. I had a great time opening my eyes to different cultures in the world. I remember at lunchtime, I was having this little job somewhere in Kensington. I go into sort of Hyde Park just to sit by the lake. It's interesting, the lake was called Serpentine. Perhaps it was, a <laughs> it was an omen of things to come. And I get so peaceful there, just so content, and hardly a worry in the world. And I thought, this is really what life is all about. Just sitting by a lake with no responsibilities, free, at ease, with my lunch hour. And of course, later on in life, you know, when you were working hard, you know, as a school teacher, you got all these responsibilities, and you lost that sense of peace and discontentment. It was only later on, as a monk, you got that contentment back again. Just when you're sitting by a lake. Now, as a monk, you sit by the mind, which is the beautiful lake inside. Just content. Having your lunch hour. 
Lunch hour is a very beautiful concept because it's a space we have between our work where we rest and we relax. This is what letting go really means. Too many people think that to let go you have to do absolutely nothing. Those of you who have been to see the monks in our monastery at Serpentine or go and see Sister at Gijigana, you know just we work really hard. But not all the time. No matter how much responsibilities and duties you have in the world, the monks learn how to put all of that down for a few moments to rest and find their inner happiness. This is the reason why people don't find happiness. They don't know how to stop. So much of our lives we keep going, hour after hour after hour. In the last week, how often have you just stopped and paused in your week and just allow everything to calm down and come to a stop? Just to sit by the lake for lunch hour, just to be at peace. We're always moving, always walking, always running, always chasing, never stopping. This is why we find no peace, no happiness, no sense of freedom in our world. We just become just obsessive doers. We've forgotten how to just stop from time to time. This is one of the reasons why Buddhist monks are happy. Why it's proven to be so. Because we know how to stop. How to let all those burdens down. Just for a few moments. It's called non-attachment, which means letting go. Sometimes we have to contemplate this first, actually to at least <coughs> convince ourselves it's worthwhile doing. Why is it we always worry about the past so much? Why is it we always just concern ourselves about the future over much? It's just an obsession which we have. It's got no validity rationally. We all know that the past is just so uncertain. What you think happened probably never did happen. Just as somebody was telling me just the other day, they were involved in a car accident. And when they went to the police station, they put the report in to the, in the police station. And afterwards they realized they made a mistake. And they thought, oh my goodness, they're going to go to jail for that. They lied to the policeman or to the police station. And I tell them, look, it's well known. Ask any policeman that when two people see a traffic accident and they take the witness statements five minutes later, those witness statements will be completely different than what actually happened. Even in five minutes ago, we can't remember exactly what happened. One of the old meditation tricks, and sometimes we do to see how mindful people were. Your shoes, where did you leave them when you came into this room? Are you sure? You think you're sure? One evening, after one of these talks, this happened actually many times, someone came in afterwards, can we use your phone? Because their car had been stolen after one of the talks. So they called the police. And of course, our caretaker went outside and said, you know, what color is your car anyway? Because there's one car left just on the other side of the car park. They'd forgotten where they could park the car. They were sure they put it there, but it went actually somewhere else. Is that, now, I think you can all relate to that, can't you? The reason why you can relate to it is because our memory is so uncertain. So why do we bother about the past so much? We don't know what really happened. We think we do, and that's the problem. When we know it's uncertain, we can actually let it go. Isn't it wonderful to be free of the past? Look at, look at how much pain it causes. What happened to you when you were a kid? Whether you passed the exam or failed the exam? You know, whether, <coughs> whether this happened or that happened, it's all gone now. You don't need, psychologically, rationally, you don't need to carry around the past because it's come a habit of ours. And because of our habits that we just torture ourselves with the past. If you're going to remember the past, why do you remember the good things which happened in the past? Why is it we always remember the bad things which happened in the past? Why is it that when we go home after a day's work, how was your day at work today? Oh, the boss shouted at me today. What else happened? Why do you always remember the rotten things which happened today? We had a car accident. 
How many times did you drive and you didn't have a car accident? Do you go home and you, you say to your wife, Oh, it's wonderful I didn't have a car accident today. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that no one shouted at me at the office today? Why is it we always focus on the faults of life? Or rather, we always focus on the faults of the past. It's just an obsession we have. With Buddhism, we actually see through wisdom, through training, we don't need to do that. We don't need to focus on the faults, focus on feeling guilty or feeling being a victim. We can actually let the whole thing go. It's allowed, it's good, other people do it, you do it, and you become more happy, become free of your past. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to do? Completely free yourself of all the past. Gone. So you've just got the present moment and the future. All the scary things which we have to think about. What's going to happen next? People get so scared of life. Recently while I was in Singapore, so many people were scared of getting SARS. I'm telling look, the chance of getting SARS are just so minimal. When I was there in Singapore, a hundred people had SARS. It was in the newspaper. hundred people today. hundred and four people. My goodness, I was trying to get those newspapers to put in 3,990,000 people, 900, didn't have SARS today. That's true because there's 4 million population in Singapore. Just think how many people didn't have that disease. And that actually puts perspective in what's going on. Why is it that we just focus on the faults all the time? Focus on negativity, fault finding. This is why in meditation we train ourselves to seek out beauty. To see the beautiful even in the breath. This simple thing like a breath just going in and going out, going in going out. It can be the most beautiful thing in the world. We see the beauty in simplicity. Why do you need a television to see all these nature movies? We've got Cottesloe Beach at sunset. We've got these beautiful forests, we've got the southwest. Why do you need to actually to manufacture beauty when you have all the beauty you like just in the moment right here? Why do you want to seek out happiness somewhere else when we've got so much happiness inside of ourselves if we'd only pause and stop to look? This is what actually the Buddha was saying. You need to go against the stream of the world which goes to seek happiness somewhere out there in the relationship, in the movie, in the food, in the sex somewhere out there, then I'll be happy Buddha said, stop and you find you have all the happiness you'll ever want stop looking, stop searching, stop trying to seek for things when you stop happiness is right there with you this is why the whole path of Buddhism is all about slowly stopping, slowly calming, letting go, being more at peace. That's the underlying theme of happiness. When we start letting go, how do we start letting go? We start letting go by being generous. We're doing a little um, fundraiser today because many of the Buddhists are Sri Lanka and because there's been huge floods in Sri Lanka. They haven't been publicized very much but they're there and people are dying. So there's a little collection out the back there. What a wonderful thing to let go. A little bit of money in Australia goes a huge way in South Asia. This is why we do this. Maybe not because the people in Sri Lanka actually they do need it. But we also need to help, to give. It's like a bit of letting go. A bit of renunciation, a bit of freedom. And if you just give a little, you get so much happiness back. I've done that in my, in my lay life, even my monastic life. Every time I give something, give my time, give my energy, go and help somebody. You just get so much back in return, so much happiness. Why? The reason is because it's being selfless, giving up, letting go, not wanting anything, but just giving for the sake of giving, sharing for the sake of sharing. This is why it makes one happy. 
So we're not doing this to get to heaven afterwards. We're not doing this to get brownie points. We're doing this actually for happiness. That's why it's so often that oh, if anyone's been to our monasteries, at Gidja Ganap, at Serpentine, even this place here on the weekend, have a look at how much food people bring for the monks. There's much, much more than we can eat. Some I remember just this one monk, the first time he went to England, and there's all these people who gave him so much food, and this Englishman came up to him, never seen a monk before, looked in his bowl, and was actually amazed, actually disgusted, actually how much food this monk had in his bowl, because he looked in there and said, blimey, that's enough to feed a bloody army. <laughs> that's what he actually said. So this monk was a bit embarrassed, but he told us a story afterwards. <laughs> because you only eat one meal a day, so it has to be quite a bit. Imagine all your dinners, all put in one, one bowl, breakfast, lunch and dinner and all that we eat in between. Of course it's a lot. But imagine, people bring so much. For the, we ask, why do you bring so much? It's not that we need it. Why do people go all the way from Perth, all the way to Serpentown, an hour's drive there, we're the only place where people actually bring us dinner well, we have guests, and where the guests do the washing up. <laughs> I mean, if you invite guests for dinner, at least you do the washing up. But our guests do the washing up as well. They feed us, they do the washing up, and they take it away afterwards. And I, ask, I keep on asking, why do people do that? And all the time, the same answer, because they get happiness out of this. They get happiness out of caring, looking after, sharing. That is the first type of happiness coming from letting go, the happiness of generosity. You're just caring, sharing, giving for others. It doesn't have to be money, just giving time, giving energy, giving effort for others. People who go and work in hospices, hospitals, just for the sake of it. This is where you get so much happiness out, out of this. For two years, when I was a student, I spent every I think it was Thursday afternoon going to a local hospital helping out with Down syndrome kids. I got so much happiness out of that, so much so that in the last, the last time when I was, well, it wasn't the last time, one of the last times I went there in the afternoon, I'd been working with these kids for so long that the everyone trusted me there. They gave me the whole group to look after. There's two groups. I looked after one whole group for myself in the first session, then we stopped for tea, and I looked after the second group in the second session. I didn't know what was going on, I was stupid. It was, after the second session, they put all the two groups of kids together, with all of the occupational therapists and all the other nurses there, to make a presentation to me. Of all the students who have ever helped out, volunteered there, I'd been there by far the longest. And they wanted to thank me. And so all these kids, these Down Syndrome kids, had actually tried to make little things, little presents for me. And they weren't sort of very well made, because these kids could not do very much. And they all presented me with these things. And my goodness, you know, you, t you cried. It was so, so touching, because I, I was stupid, I didn't expect, I didn't know what they were up to. And after making this presentation, they said that, you know, you've been the student who's come here the longest, we know that it's finals week, next week. You have to do your exams. So this will be your last, last session. And I, <laughs> I always remember this. I asked, you, asked him, said, look, my exams don't start for another week. Can I please come back next week again? <laughs> and I actually almost like begged to come back again. And I did this because I enjoyed it. I wouldn't miss it for the world. I got happiness out of that. It wasn't doing service in the sense of, you know, I was, I was trying to sort of sacrifice myself for others. I was getting so much happiness out of this, it was fun. I was lear learning about how compassion makes you happy, how service, giving, it's letting go again. And that's actually why I started keeping my precepts, because of letting go. You didn't need to have alcohol to be happy. You didn't need to sort of lie, you know, to, to get, sort of get your way in the world. You didn't need any of these things. You just you are happy quite naturally. Why is it that sort of people have to go and drink to be happy? I can't I can't understand it myself. 
happiness is natural to people if they can just let go and stop worrying about things. To be able to let go of the past, not be afraid of the future, you can enjoy each other's company. If you're in an aeroplane, so what if it gets hijacked? Nice story to tell people on a Friday night when you sort of next come, <laughs> next come to Perth. There's people in Singapore told me once that if you actually get killed in an aircraft, it's one of the best ways of dying, for two reasons, like dying in an air crash. The reason is, that first of all, it's instantaneous, you don't feel anything. And number two, your relations get a big insurance payout. <laughs> and there's no need for a funeral, number three. You sort of cremated on the spot. It saves a lot of problems, you know, sort of all going to funerals. I was just sort of funeral last Thursday, spending hours and hours in these ceremonies and boxes. And so it's you know, three reasons why it's a great, great way to die if you're on an aircraft crash. <laughs> you see what we're meaning there is actually you know, sort of making it enjoyable. <laughs> Why not? Because in Buddhism you try and make happiness out of anything. And this is and this is I'm not just saying this, this is true. You get sick and they say, Well a wonderful opportunity, you're sick. At last you've got a chance to rest, stay in bed all day. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful you've got an opportunity for other people to look after you? So many people tell me this, that when they get in these great sicknesses, they feel so touched, how many people care about them. It becomes this beautiful way of people being allowed to express their compassion to other people. That's why if we really know about sickness and how to deal with it, it becomes a beautiful time of our lives for those who can help us and serve us and look after us. That's why one of those monks, years and years ago, visiting his parents in Chicago. Chicago is a very, very cold city, especially in the winter. It's, it snows, it's icy. He slipped and broke his leg. He was put in hospital. And he told me that when his mother came into the ward and saw him, she had a big smile on, his, on her face. He couldn't understand, why are you happy that I've got broken my leg? And his mother said, at last I've got you where I want you. Because <laughs> his mother just wanted to mother him. And now he was in hospital for a couple of weeks, he couldn't go anywhere, he was stuck there, great, I can mother you. Isn't that wonderful to be able to help other people, to serve them, look after them, care for them? It's a privilege to care, if you know about letting go. You get so much happiness of looking after someone else who's sick in pain, seeing how I can actually relieve and help that pain. I can be a friend to you, how I can care for you, how I can express my love for you. Sometimes it's so hard to express love. But when a person's sick, we can do that. It's almost like one of the times we're allowed to really just show how much we care. That's why sickness can be such a wonderful, moving time. So even in sickness you can make it good, enjoyable, growing from it. You can make it happy. And that's why that if you bring happiness to sickness, the sickness doesn't last all that long. Happiness means the endorphins in the bloodstream sort of get secreted. Nature's uh, um, painkiller increases the immune system. This is actually why you keep it happy, even in hospital. And even in deaths as well. You know, you've seen all the, way, the times I've done funeral services. Many of you have been to those already. And if you haven't been to one yet, you will do one day when I go and do yours. <laughs> and you make them happy. Well, why not? Last Thursday, yesterday, was a funeral service for a Sri Lankan lady who died, 42, comes here regularly. One of the things I noticed there, I gave a nice little sermon there, a little talk about just, no, death is okay, nothing wrong with it. But I noticed afterwards that just when, I had everybody sort of nice and calm and peaceful, but what happened was when people actually said, gave their condolences. It was like Westerners, they weren't Buddhists. And I sort of, really should have gone up and told them, look, don't do that ever again. Everyone was nice and peaceful, but then they came out, oh, you poor thing, oh, isn't it terrible, oh, isn't it awful, oh. And of course they sort of conditioned that response from other people. They made the death 
sort of a sad occasion, just because of our unwise responses to what's going on. It wasn't their wife who died, but they said, oh, isn't it sad, isn't it terrible? Because we've been conditioned to think like that. And Buddhists, when they've changed that conditioning, they can actually take all of these occasions in life, death and sickness, disappointments, and they can handle it with much greater ease, less suffering, even with happiness. After all, when a person dies, their job in this world is over. It's like retiring. Aren't you happy when you retire? You don't have to go to work anymore. It's like some of the prisoners I used to see in jail. When they got released from prison, they used to, well, it's their custom, they shouldn't have been doing this, they're supposed to be Buddhists, but they used to have these champagne breakfasts down in Jaredale. They were free. So when you're dead, you're free. Free from having to go to work in the morning, free from having to sort of all this painful body, which is usually happens when you're dying. Isn't that a wonderful thing? <laughs> so a lot of times that people have the wrong attitude towards these things, and as Buddhists we can see things in a different way. And said here many, many times, when you die, do you want other people to be upset and cry? When you die, do you want other people to be miserable that you're not there anymore? Of course not. All human beings, because we love our friends, our relations, our, our loved ones, we want them to be happy. So why are people just so stubborn and never pay any account to the person who they're supposed to be um, paying respects to? If they were really paying respects to the person in the coffin, they wouldn't be so sad. Because paying respects is respecting their wishes. and wishes for you to be happy. So it's just a different way of looking at things. And this is, again, letting go. When we know how to let go of each other, then we know how to be happy. This is why, again, Buddhists are happy. Because they can let go of some of these things which happen in life, which other people think are sad and terrible. Buddhists know many, many times you've lived, you've been here, done that so many times, we enjoy each other's company and then we go again. It would be terrible if we were the same person forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Variety is the spice of life, and not trying to say, sort of keep changing your partners. But you know, next, next lifetime maybe, who knows. But what we're actually saying there is that we don't take these causes for suffering and causes for pain, which people usually do in the world, as, as, as huge problems anymore. There's another way of looking at it. And the Buddhism gave that other way, called letting go. A lot of times it's because our thought becomes so narrow-minded, so conditioned, always thinking in the same way. That's why when somebody dies, oh, isn't it sad? Or when, you know, sometimes that, you know, when people fall in love, isn't it happy? When a baby is born, oh, congratulations, we've got our cultural conditioning here. But if you think about it, what does a baby do when it's born? It cries. And all the relations are, are, are laughing. When somebody dies, you can see them smiling, and everyone else is crying. We get it the wrong way around every time. Surely the person is actually being born or, or, or dying, they should know. <laughs> so the point is here that some of our cultural conditioning is not all that helpful. And that's all it actually is, is cultural conditioning. And Buddhism actually tries to stop that conditioning. Stopping it through, through mindfulness, through seeing what's going on. It's marvelous, is whenever you have a problem in your life, Actually, instead of looking at the problem outside, look at the person who's reacting to this problem. Look at what's going on inside of you. You know, when somebody's dying, or when there's sickness, or when there's a loss. Look what's actually going on inside, not what's going on outside. Because the problem is that now, when there's any tragedy in life, it's always we focus outside of ourselves. Oh, that poor thing. Oh, my, stock, my stocks have gone down. I've lost money. This. What's happening actually inside is more important to see. When you actually start seeing what's inside, which is what mindfulness is supposed to do, what contemplation is supposed to do, 
you actually just see some of the silly ways we react to these things. And just how we allow these things to create suffering in our mind. It's a big deal. You get money, you lose money, sickness and health, life and death, the dualities of the world, they come and they go. That's why you know, part of Buddhism is like just the impermanence, like that teaching of the Emperor's Ring, which is a powerful teaching. Don't mind how many times I repeat it, because I practice that myself. The Emperor was always getting depressed when things went wrong, always having parties when things were going right. Because he got depressed, he would sulk and stay in his room. Because when things were going well, he'd always hold parties. He never did any work. And because of that, the kingdom got worse and worse. And so the ministers met together, how can we teach this young emperor to be wise, so he can run a good kingdom? And all they did was give him a ring. A gold ring, but on the outside of that ring were inscribed the words, This too will pass. That's all. So when things were going well in the kingdom, he'd look at the ring, This too will pass. You can't take it for granted. So he worked even harder. Even when things were going well, he couldn't ha afford to have parties all the time because he knew that the good times would pass. They were unstable. They needed work to keep them going longer and he gave it that work. Now all your relationships, you've got a good relationship with your partner, that too will pass. Because you know that, you put more care more attention, more effort into your relationship because you can't take it for granted. Are you healthy? Have you got sickness? Remember, this too will pass. So if you're in good health, look after that. You put effort and care into your health because it's of the nature to get sick. You will look after it. You don't take it for granted. And your life, this too will pass. So, look after this life of yours. Make sure it's rich. Rich in goodness. Rich in those sorts of things which we talk about at funerals. The goodness, the care, the love of a person. Because this too will pass. And when you're sick, you know that story with Ajahn Cha when I was sick in hospital in Thailand? The first time I was sick with typhus fever, I was there about three or four weeks couldn't find out what was wrong with me at first. Then later on we found out it was typhus. You know what it's like in a third world country, in the backwater of a third world country, in a hospital ward. My first memory of that ward was at six o'clock in the evening, the nurse went. After seven o'clock, still the nurse, night nurse hadn't come. So I turned around to the monk sitting in the next bed, When's the night nurse coming? Should we try and tell someone the nurse hasn't turned up? What do you mean night nurse? There ain't no night nurses here. If you get sick in the middle of the night, that's just bad karma. Thank you very much. And so I had this terrible fever, week after week. And then Ajahn Chah came to visit me, my teacher, this great monk, came to visit little me. I was only a young monk, a baby monk. And he's such an important big monk and he came to see me. You know what it's like when these people come and see you? And I felt so elated for about one minute. Because when Ajahn Chah came in, you know what he said? He said, Brahma Wang So, you're either going to get better or you're going to die. And then he left. Thank you very much. <laughs> but just how true that was. He didn't sort of mess around. He just told it as it is. How can you f make fault with that? You, that's true. Whenever you get sick, it's not going to last. This too will pass. So you don't have to worry about being sick because you're either going to die or you're going to get better. One of the two. <laughs> so what it means, the pain is not going to last forever. There's, you know, there's the, the weakness. This is what I mean by this too will pass. So no matter what's happening, if you're in grief or whatever, it will pass. You don't have to worry about it. If you're depressed, you're in depression, don't worry about it, it will pass. 
And I just see how long you can be depressed for. See if you can beat your record. I keep notes. See if you can be depressed for longer than you did last time. <laughs> All you're doing there is you just, when you're actually saying that, to see how long you'll be depressed for, it's reminding you that it won't last forever. This, this is the trouble with depression or sickness. When you think it's got no end to it, then you can't handle it any longer. And that really becomes suffering. But when you know it's going to end, then you know it's tolerable. This is actually why when we realize that things will pass, whether it's sickness, disappointment or whatever, we can actually handle it. It makes much greater happiness. When we know it's going to pass, we're letting go. So this is actually why Buddhists are happier than other people, because we can let go, it will pass. It doesn't matter what happens. When I first became the abbot of the monastery in, in Serpentine, I made this resolution. I thought, well, it doesn't really matter. If I do really well, then that's great and can help a lot of people. But it would be even better if I really stuff up and make a mess of things, because then people can leave me alone. I can become a hermit. That's even better. It's always a win-win situation. I keep, that's always in life it's a win-win situation, if you know the Dhamma. It doesn't matter what happens. If I die tomorrow, it's great. Be at peace at last. If I don't die, then I can actually work harder and do more good karma for other people. Either way, it's a win-win situation. So this is actually just a different way of looking at things in life. If your husband leaves you, then it's a win situation. You can go off and become a nun. <laughs> it's so hard with a husband over there because you've got to look after them and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> So it's always a win-win situation. If they don't leave you, then you've got a nice companion for your old age. Someone to work and pay the rent. <laughs> so it's always a win-win situation. Whichever. So looking at the positive side of life, and why not? Why is it that human beings we always tend to look at the negative side of life? There is a positive side there, so have a look at it. And incorporate that into your life. What is said in that little essay there about seeing the beauty in things. That's why it's so hard for, as a monk, to get angry at other people. Because you see so much beauty in other people. I can get angry at them for doing that, things like that. I see this you know, stupidity of some of the monks in the monastery. Because I saw myself, I used to be even worse than that when I was a young monk. So how can you be sort of critical of others and get angry at others? You just can't do it, because you see the beauty of other people. In Mahayana Buddhism, we see that the Buddha nature in others. How can you be angry at Saddam Hussein? <laughs> you can see the good side in him. How can you be angry at Adolf Hitler? Can you? As a monk, it's just so hard, because you see the goodness in each person. Sure, they've got some badness in there, some silly things they do. You see so much goodness inside of them, so much potential for goodness. That's why you can't get angry at them. You know that story which I've <laughs> been telling people about the, the in Thailand during the Vietnam War, when there was the insurgency there, and they, where they solved that insurgency by giving amnesty, giving forgiveness. And I told that story in Sydney just uh, about a month ago, and. In that story, I say, the non-violence, so the Thai soldiers never went and blow up the communists, the insurgents. These were communists inside the country, Thai people. Number two, they tried to address the real problem by looking after the countryside, making it sort of prosperous. And number three, they had this forgiveness, amnesty. Any of these communist guerrillas, terrorists, internal terrorists, who were blowing up soldiers, torturing monks, <laughs> some of the... the Forest monks got captured and actually tortured to death. They had this amnesty. Whenever you wanted to give yourself up, you can go back to your village, go back to your university, wherever. And so eventually the, all the communists gave themselves up and, and they were just completely forgiven. And the point came when the leaders of the communist army gave themselves up. And I told you the story before, you may remember, that they got given good jobs in the, the Thai government service. 
That's as far as I knew. And I told that story in Sydney. The Thai consul stood up and asked a question. It wasn't a question. He said, it's a very interesting story. They wanted to add an addenda to it. He said, two of those leaders, of the communists, they were given good jobs in the civil servants, civil service. And those two of them are presently ministers in the Thai government. One a very senior minister. I was so impressed. These were people who would normally be actually put in front of a wall and shot dead. Or they'd been put in jails to rot for the rest of their life. Or hung for war crimes. But they were given forgiveness. And they had their chance to use their abilities, organizing abilities, their commitment to a cause for the government. It's a beautiful sort of strategy, and the Thai government took them in and actually made them work for the Thai people. And now they are actually ministers in the government. Ex communist guerrillas who are trying to overturn the government are now working for it. What do I mean about forgiveness? That's Buddhist attitudes. Isn't that a wonderful use of our resources? That's why you can see the good in everybody. There's potential there. So we can actually change the world by not wasting the great resources, but by turning them into good resources. That's why I can't get angry at people. You can see the Buddha nature, the goodness in everybody. This is actually why you can be happy. So these are many, many little pointers here. Different ideas of actually creating happiness in one's life. Seeing beauty in everything. Beauty in sickness, beauty in death, beauty in many things. That's why Buddhists are happy. And it's been proven. And there we go. So if you want to be happy, this is the place to come. What I usually call happy hour at Dhammaloka Buddhist Centre. So thank you for coming to Happy <laughs> Happier. <laughs> and may you all get happier and happier and happier. So thank you for listening to Why Buddhists Are Happy.